There is much talk about protecting ourselves from being manipulated. For instance, Robert Greene, a writer, has said he lost 60 or 70 jobs before becoming a writer, and he learned so much. And amongst the things he writes about and talks about all the time now, on YouTube or in lectures, is manipulation. Also, the psychologist um, Wayne Dyer had written at least one book on manipulation that really took off. I think it might have been called Pulling Your Own Strings. Or it may have been called, um, alternatively, Your Erroneous Zones, or, or both of these books to that effect, Manipulation. Now, I believe in my own mind from writing and clarifying things that manipulation is seeking short-term expediency to seemingly get the biggest bang for the buck in the short term, but I believe you almost inevitably pay the piper down the line. You have, in essence, blowback down the line. It comes, quote, to haunt you. If in no other way than feelings of guilt and trying to evade guilt feelings by isolating or constant blame shifting or both. I like, too, phrases from scriptures sometimes, including, don't build your house on the sand, or words to that effect. In other words, don't build a life based upon something shaky, including a short-term expediency way of life involving manipulation or shortcuts. Now, certain shortcuts can be taken, I would call that a long-term expediency way of life, like mowing your lawn with a lawnmower, not tweezers or scissors. That's a long-term uh, expedient way of life, I call it. But all too often, we hear these words then, and I believe tied to short-term expediency or manipulation or what have you. Words like, he or she is a flim-flam artist, or a con man, or a fraud, or trying to get over on us, or they have a scam going, or words like uh, they pulled a fast one on us, or they stabbed us in the back when we weren't looking. Or, you know, often the word lie, lie, lie. Uh, words too, and procedures involving blame shifting in general. Now there's a man two years ago I ran across, Ayman Agi, who puts out a lot of information on course creating and entrepreneurship. He has fascinating videos, I believe two of them, on YouTube about his life. Fascinating. Amongst the things though he said that struck me to this day is you can't skip steps. Well, I suppose sometimes you can as part of an overall efficient strategy of optimizing, but uh, then I don't think we should call this skipping steps per se. Maybe he should better have said in the long run, don't skip the essential steps. Uh, he didn't say, though, there can be quite a bit of work involved in doing that approach in life. I'll give a humorous example. I've always been tall and thin, and I went out for the basketball team in high school once, 10th uh, grade, uh, and I thought, oh boy, I can learn basketball in one hour, and then I'll be a superstar, or at least good enough, on that team I was analogizing what I was able to do in my classroom studies on the basketball court, thinking you can master basketball in one hour. I suppose I thought you can skip all kinds of essential steps. Now to bring home this concept of essential steps or essential components that you ought not skip, I suppose, for it'll come back to bite you in the long term, surely almost inevitably, take a car. 
When you buy a car, you assume all the essential components or systems, you could call them steps in a way, are there. Um, alternatively, if you want to buy something and you pay a certain amount of money and then you're told, oh, by the way, you might want this component or it's not going to be a very good performer. And then this happens again 10 minutes later and 10 minutes later. We call that being nickeled and dimed until you get all the essential components. Kind of like going to a used car salesman and saying, oh, I'd like to buy that car. And then you're about to sign the dotted line and he says, oh, by the way, the transmission is about ready to fall out. It's tied in with a rope. And then a minute later, you find out, he says, um, oh, by the way, this also has uh, problems with the anti-brake system or anti-something um, anti system with the brakes. And you're getting thus nickeled and dimed. You're getting manipulated. You're getting short-term expedienced. Now, there are those even who practice this as a way of life, as a professional, it is called, in some career field. And when it catches up with them, this kind of approach, due to having skipped essential key steps in their um, capacity to do the job, well, they pack up and leave town and restart in another town. Maybe with a new corporate name or a new um, branding, what have you. Other approaches sometimes, I believe, in this fashion to skip steps or to what they call in the past, get out the paddle or the whip or the strap to administer knowledge, shall we say. But I believe in the long term this usually causes much more problematic things than not. Although letting your child run amok is equally as um, problematic or indulging them in general. I've seen that happen in playgrounds and such parking lots. That goes quite awry also. I think, too, a short-term expedient role in blame shifting, saying it's always other people's fault but mine, and I have no flaws, and see, my car's always washed. It's a new model car. Everything's spotless and put away. Must be other people's fault, including their genetics. Or maybe we say, well, they just chose to be that way, and or they enjoy suffering. Others get ahead sometimes in short-term manner, manipulatively by rushing people as to making decisions, including decisions on purchases or uh, their future life, various components. Yet others may try to manipulate by appeal to things such as their credentials or science. Noting, by the way, there is a book, How to Lie with Statistics, and I suppose there ought to be a word, how to, or book, How to Lie with Science. Noting, at least one man I've read in a book talked of pseudoscience versus real science, but who's to know the difference? Also, science, I believe, can have far too much data smog and miss the forest for the trees and still be called science. Maybe the greatest scientific concept in the world is to be able to see and justify what's right in front of your nose without 10 billion scientific studies to tell you what you saw already. Other ways to manipulate? Guilt. Yes, guilt, a biggie. And, of course, fear. Instill fear. And still also using words, fear that I call catastrophizing, strong fear. So if one wants something, and we all do, don't we call that in essence our Weltanschauung in Europe in the past, philosophically, our major goals, or as Simon Sinek says, know your why. Maybe there's a better approach than the manipulative approach. Maybe it involves more a brick-by-brick brick laying of something with a solid foundation. This, of course, requires patience. Nothing is built overnight, hence the phrase 
Rome wasn't built in a day. I suppose it could be built in a day on a, um, a city built on sand, so to speak, or uh, you build something that's a mirage. Now you could call this, um, what is it, um, smoke and mirrors? Something to that effect, that phrase. Now I like a concept I'm going to bring up of tools. Sometimes we don't have what it takes to do something without a tool to make it happen far more efficiently. And in this case, you might call it long-term um, efficiency. What's that phrase I was using? Long-term expediency, which is, in my mind, the best way of going about something. Um, that's building something on a firm foundation. It's not going to cause blowback down the line. Um, for instance, you've also heard so-and-so got away because they were very um, charismatic. I suppose in that term, we're talking about using um, intonation, body language, and rate of speech and intimidation to accomplish something in the short term. Of course, we call such people sometimes flashes in the pan, I think, as to what they get, but that can take perhaps 20, 30 years to discover such individuals as to they're not being happy campers later in life with that approach. For instance, a lawyer in court probably has a couple key ways of proceeding forward. They can rush the audience. They can appeal to their credentials and awards. They can intimidate. They can be, quote, condescending. In other words, put others down in the audience, jurors, judges, who knows what, to destroy or reduce their level of self-esteem and pump theirs up. And if I didn't mention already, they can rush people. I think the word flimflam artist or uh, city slicker comes to mind to exemplify that concept. Now, Abraham Lincoln, the lawyer and statesman and president of past, used logic and thorough preparation and usually strove to uh, have great levels of respect or just backed off and said nothing for long periods of time sometimes if necessary. A form of what I call, in a sense, tongue biting. Or, as some say, waiting until you have the right words or the best words optimally speaking. So, Lincoln used sheer logic. Thorough preparation, especially in terms of knowing both sides' arguments and mindset backwards and forwards, or so it is said. Use of the optimal amount of respectful words and the optimal amount of waiting until you have such. Biting your tongue when necessary. Maybe also playing cat and mouse games when necessary. Um, and as per one man who calls himself a member of the Black Swan Group and wrote, never split the difference. I think his name was Chris something. Two key points come out in the videos he has put out for free on YouTube. Number one, high levels of respect accorded to others and I suppose oneself too. That goes without saying. And secondly, don't rush people in their decision making, in their thinking. I notice Brian Tracy has essentially said the same thing especially with regard to this, don't rush people. Now, in an audiobook I've listened to by Napoleon Hill, and he discusses in there times he's talked with um, Andrew Carnegie, who had funded and encouraged him earlier. He talks of a key component here of optimal relations or harmonious relations and how much better life will go if you have achieved that, relatively speaking. 
Dale Carnegie, I notice, has said exactly the same thing. He essentially said in How to Win Friends and Influence People that if you achieve such, people will be like putty in your hand, or words to that effect. One of these individuals had said that. Not that I would like to use that phraseology. It sounds a little manipulative, but at any rate, you probably get my drift. My cutesy little analogy, with a lot of truth, I think, is if one comes to that point in time of very great people relations, then I think life kind of lets you in by the back door without paying the huge cover charge and having to stand in the long line out front. Whether it's uh, some great nightclub, but analogously speaking, anything in life. You're allowed in the back door, quick entry, um, a note of recognition passes between the people. This guy's okay, let him in. Um, you're just taken as an okay guy. You're on the good side of the friend or foe evaluation process. I noticed this, for instance, with a photographer, now perhaps in her 80s or 90s, if still alive, Liesel, that might have been her first name or last name, from Europe originally, if not still. She achieved a point at which she could get into the White House within five minutes, through the back door, basically. I've also observed that you will be basically handed all kinds of things free or discounted heavily various items or get them quicker than Jiminy Cricket or with great credit terms. You'll also be passed along to you their friends' um, names, where to go for the best this and that job at the cheapest price, how to make allies quickly, and so on. You'll be given the best information. But to get to that point is to have to work on yourself very, very hard. As one dating coach I had read, might have been Wigand and the name pops into mind, said, many people of both genders, male and female, don't work on themselves enough, but think they have arrived. And for the older gentleman, say, wanting to date or marry or what not a younger gal, he often, the dating coach says, misinterprets that he has it made in the shade because of lots of money or some kind of clout that way, but he has not worked on himself and is fooling himself. He took the short-term expedient right way. I think, too, then, that's why we hear the word improve your character or your reputation. Noting, by the way, I noticed listening to a video a week ago on a German general from World War II, Rommel, that ironically, amongst the Allied forces, he had a lot of respect accorded or felt in the Allied forces. And in fact, um, Hitler disliked him so much, maybe he wasn't the greatest in terms of respect level toward Hitler, that Hitler forced him to take poison, lest his whole family be killed. Now, I'm not going to comment any more about any Nazi, so to speak, um, any person in the German forces in World War II, but at least he was an unusual bird, I think. In fact, Evie Pamperis and Chris, somebody or another, again, who has written uh, Don't Split the Difference, and there being a few others also who have uh, written books, say, from the CIA perspective, all talking about how if you accord somebody you are interrogating or wanting to arrest high levels of respect and basically that they've never gotten before or rarely from any other source, you not only extract confessions, but literally almost lead them by the hand willingly to prison. Uh, for whatever happens afterward, that's a different question. I've seen that too with repeated shows on the Columbo series, Peter Falk, where at the end, the caught party, so to speak, admits it, almost literally sticks their hands out in front and says, please put the handcuffs on, 
And I love so much that you gave me respect um, that I'm glad this is all over. And um, thank you for taking me to the donut shop and a cup of coffee before police headquarters is almost the next word. So we can influence greatly, I think, by building brick by brick, respect level, and non-manipulation. We can build it through our words that are respectful. I do believe this. My father had a PhD, still does in English literature, and this was impressed upon me greatly early on, as well as later watching many videos and reading on this. And as far as the tools involved, rather than, quote, manipulative tools, consider this movie, this Western, Quigley Down Under, featuring Tom Selleck. Yes, a Western, fascinating movie in many respects of a man, I believe in Colorado it is portrayed, who was hired to go to Australia to shoot Aborigines. But uh, he balks at this once he finds it out to be the case, and the story plays out. But the thing is, he's an excellent marksman, bar, mon bar none. He has a certain tool, and it's not um, flim-flamming people per se. Couldn't we thus rely upon the tools of optimal word choice for respect, and the building of respect, the building of character, can't we build something called a powerful tool based on non-manipulativeness in general, including non-blame shifting? Can't we give people the time to think things through rather than being forced by being rushed? I close finally with this fascinating video available on YouTube by E.V. Pamperis. It's a TED Talk. Words, colon, your most powerful weapon, Evie Pamperus.